Uh, good day, everyone. You are welcome to today's session on principles of auditing. Um, this flows from our previous lectures on the nature, scope, and purpose of auditing. And so if you have not watched that um, class, that video of that class, I recommend that you watch that first before coming over to this. Uh, because this is a continuation of that uh, of that lecture. Um, this class speaks to the regulatory framework of auditing. And we actually started this section of the syllabus in our last video, where we looked at um, the requirement to maintain proper books of accounts, the need for uh, the content, expected content of proper books of account. Um, in that video, we also spoke about the remuneration and appointment of auditors, what the rule says about that. And then we discussed about um, who is responsible for appointing auditors. And if you remember correctly, we said uh, that auditors are generally appointed by the shareholders at an annual general meeting. But for the first directors, they would often be appointed by, so for the first auditors place, they would often be appointed by the directors. And whenever an auditor is appointed, the whole office for a period of one year until the next um, annual general meeting. We also discuss remuneration of auditors. When we say remuneration, we're speaking of salary, their pay. Um, who is responsible for fixing their remuneration. And, and uh, if, if you recall, we said that uh, the remuneration would generally be fixed by the party that appointed the auditor for a period of one year. So let's move to our class for today proper. And today's class speaks to the requirement, the requirement, the regulatory requirement around uh, we'll start with the removal and resignation of auditors. Um, so this section, uh, this part of the class speaks to um, conditions under which an auditor can leave the audit client or the company they are auditing. Um, think of it like um, an employee of an organization. Um, there are a number of uh, ways employees leave an organization. Think of it that way. So for an employee, you could decide um, after, an, after working for some time that you want to leave, you want to resign. You no longer want to continue with that um, employer. Um, a second way an employee could leave business is you're looking at the fact that um, the, organi the organization itself, not the employer, this, not the employee this time, but the organization itself decides that possibly the employee is no longer required because of uh, possibly error in his or her work. And they feel that uh, they no longer uh, recover the skills and the knowledge to continue with their work. That's the second way an employee could leave. Um, the third way is if the employer decides that um, this employee, it's time to replace him or her. And then the fourth way someone could leave a job, it's related to contract related rules. You know, there are some rules that uh, some jobs you take on that uh, it's valid for like a number of years, say two years. And then after two years, you decide you ask to um, renew that contract. And so at the end of the two years, you could decide to accept that renewal or not to accept the renewal. Um, so th thinking of it from that area, uh, um, when it comes to auditors leaving their client, there are a number of ways that it will leave, similar to the way employees leave an organization. However, to protect the independence and the integrity of uh, the auditing profession, company law provides certain rules with regards to resignation of an auditor. And these rules are the same for many um, jurisdictions, including countries like Nigeria and Ghana. So what are the rules? If you are an auditor and you decide today, I want to resign. I no longer want to serve as an auditor for my company or for this company. I don't want to serve as the external auditor. What are the steps you can take to um, for your resignation? The first step is that you need to notify the audit client, which is the company, of your intent to resign the appointment in writing. And that, right, that letter should be addressed to the company's registered office address. So that means that oral form of resignation is not acceptable. It has to be in writing and addressed to the company, addressed to its 
registered official address with uh, uh, the company's uh, uh, affairs. Now, in that letter where you indicate that you want to resign, the law requires that um, uh, that it, it provides for two things listed on that letter. One of them is optional. The second is mandatory. So by optional, we, you, we mean you may decide to include it or not include it. By mandatory, we mean you need to include that in your letter for it to be valid, for it to be, for it to be considered a valid resignation letter or notice of resignation. So one, it's that it's optional, but it's required that you actually state your effective date of resignation. Um, effective date would mean when would you would see season as an auditor of the company. So you could say, assuming you're writing the letter in January, you could say by 31st of February, I no longer want to serve as an auditor of this company. However, if you don't state the resignation date or the effective date of your resignation the letter, it is assumed that your resignation becomes effective by the date that the company is notified. So that is an optional provision or an, an optional item that needs to be stated on the letter. But I said that there's also a compulsory element that will be stated. And that compulsory element is what is called statement of circumstance. So your letter will not be accepted as effective, even though you've stated your effective date, unless it contains that statement of circumstance. What is the meaning of that word, statement of circumstance? When we say circumstance, that word speaks to um, the situation, the reason for your resignation. So you need to state in your letter whether there is anything you think should be brought to the, to the notice of the members or creditors of the company. Because basically your report, as you mentioned in, uh, in the previous uh, class, is to the owner. So if you're addressing a letter to the company and there is something that you think they need to know, possibly um, there's something going on in the company or you're not getting the required support and you need to, you need to uh, discuss that with them, it's important that you state it in your letter of resignation. So that statement you include is called statement of circumstance. And if you move in, if you don't have any reason, maybe possibly because um, of some other issues or some or your personal fee you no longer want to continue for some other uh, reasons, you should state that as, as well in your letter. So those are the, those, that's the key requirement for an auditor who wants to resign. Now the law also has some requirement for the company when they receive that letter. What are these requirements? Now, within 14 days after they receive that your letter of resignation at the registered office, the company is required to do two things. One, they're required to send a copy of that letter to the Corporate Affairs Commission or Registrar of Companies, if it's um, a Ghanaian company or whatever um, the name is for the, the body that is responsible for company affairs in your country. So they need to send that copy, copy of that letter you to find them of um, the notice from the company's auditors to resign. And if your letter contains a state, the, the statement of circumstance, if, if your statement of circumstance really, you've mentioned that you want, uh, you, you have certain things you need to bring to the notice of some members of the company or creditors, it's also required that that letter be sent to them as well, notifying them of your intent and the, the content of your letter. The fourth thing is that after the letter has been circulated, the law gives room for whoever feels aggrieved, whoever has some concerns about that letter or the statement of circumstance contained in that letter to a apply to the court for review. So if, for instance, the auditor in his letter of circumstance, uh, in, sorry, in his letter of resignation states as in, under the statement of circumstance that he's resigning because he's not getting required documents from the company, and the company feels that that is not correct, or feels that that statement is defamatory, they could decide to take the matter to court. And the court on receipt of that complaint is required to examine 
um, that complaint. And if in the course of examining that complaint, you feel that the auditor doesn't have a valid reason for, for resigning his appointment or the reason stated is not true or defamatory, so to say, the court has the right to say, to, uh, to say, to deny that request for resignation and also ask that the auditor should be a part or even all of the legal fees that are being cured with regards to that proceeding. And final, finally, the company shall within 14 days after they've gotten the court decision, send the feedback of that decision to the registrar of companies, the shareholders and the creditors are going to be required to notify them of the order of the court. These are the provisions for the removal of an auditor. So let's quickly run through that. One, it's you need to write to the company. Two, you need to ensure that you include in your letter a statement of circumstance, which is the reason for your resignation. Or if there is anything you think you need, you want to bring to the attention of members of the company, the owners of the business, or creditors, that's your responsibility, and that's what is required. You need to resign. The company has some, some, some requirement as well. First, you need to send a letter to the registrar of companies. Secondly, if the statement of circumstance required that notice be brought to the attention of some parties, you need to ensure that that is done. Um, the, uh, the last part around court, uh, sending the notification regarding the court decision comes into place where a party who is aggrieved or has some concern about that letter decides to take the matter to court. So that is one, one way an auditor can leave its audit client. A second way an auditor can leave its audit client is the fact that as the owner of the business, you have a right to appoint and uh, remove your auditor. So the law provides for that, but you need to follow the laid down procedures. And so the owners of a company may by ordinary resolution passed at an annual general meeting, remove an auditor from office at any time before the expiration of his term of office. You remember we said that the auditor, when he's appointed at the annual general meeting, and after that appointment, he holds office from that annual general meeting to the next one. So let's assume he's appointed, annual general meeting, it's in January, and that appointed to, uh, to start to work as to serve as auditors from January. So that appointment is, me is meant to run from January to December. Now, between this period, the company can decide to call a meeting and remove the auditor at any time before it gets to, to December. Now, that's to remove the auditor, all it requires is an ordinary resolution. So what do we mean by ordinary resolution? Ordinary resolution simply means simple majority. So you have members of the company coming together. Let's assume we have six people as members of the company. And then out of, uh, um, no, let's assume seven. So we have seven people. So out of seven, we have um, four, say yes, three, say no. Just one, just one, one different news that said yes and no. So because it's an ordinary res resolution, that is enough to remove the auditor from office. However, there are some requirements. Before you can remove the auditor from office, you need to give prior notice to the auditor of your decision to remove them from office. Now, after that resolution is passed to remove the auditor from, from office, the law requires that the company notifies the register of companies, just like it, it did, just like it's required when you when the auditor resigned, you need to notify the commission or the register of companies within 14 days of the decision by the members that the auditor should be removed from office. Now, the fact that you remove the auditor from office, please take note of this point does not deprive the auditor of whatever compensation or damages that is payable to him or her in respect of or to them in respect of the termination. So for, for most engagement, if you're terminating someone from their role, you need to compensate them. So you can't say 
uh, we're removing you from office. And so because we're from office, you're not entitled to any compensation. That is not valid. The company is required to, to compensate the auditors if it is due such a compensation. Now, let's also remember that the law provides that if you decide to remove an auditor from office, let's assume that you have this request that the auditor is not, um, it's not doing well or is negligent. The auditor has a right to be heard. So at the annual general meeting where the resolution is to be passed, the auditor reserves the right to be heard and to explain their situation or, their, or to explain themselves with regards to the matter. What is the objective of this provision around removal of an auditor? There are two key objectives. Please take note of that. There are two key objectives or reasons why it's important that this law is provided for on the removal of an auditor. One, it is to preserve the right of the shareholders to appoint the auditors of their choice. The shareholders are the owners of the business. And as the owners of the business, you should have a right to decide on who are the key partners or the, who, are, who are the members, who are, who are the key partners or employees of the business and who you put in charge to give you report on the credibility of the financial statement. So if you're not comfortable with the auditors, possibly you have some concerns around their independence or the quality of the work, being the owner, the lawyer is provided to give you that right to make a decision. The law is also designed to protect the independence of the auditor. How? And that is because the management or the directors on their own accord cannot remove the auditors. That removal has to be from the owners of the business. So those are the key objective of having this provision on removal of an auditor. Let me take that again. The provision on removal of an auditor is important to achieve two things. One, to protect the independence of the auditors, and two, to give the owners of the business who are shareholders the right to, on the, to appoint an auditor of their choice. Now let's look at a, a third way an auditor can depart the audit client, um, and that is if the company makes a decision to replace the auditor. The company makes a decision to replace the auditor. And so auditors can be removed from office by a resolution at the annual general meeting to appoint new auditors. But in this case, special notice is required of such a resolution. And the auditors may, prior to the annual general meeting, be given that option to present their case as to why they think they should stay in office. So if the firm could decide, the company could decide to say, we don't, we want to replace this auditor with another auditor. It's their choice. But if they are to do that, it should be through a special notice to members to the auditor. And if the auditor has a right, is given a right to make a representation or to be present at that meeting to address issues and to also state why they think they should stay in office. The second rule on removal of an auditor speaks more to when there's a concern around um, the performance of the auditor. There's a concern around the quality of work done by the auditor. But the third one is based on personal preference per se by the audit firm. So they feel this auditor should be replaced. A fourth way an auditor could depart is by refusing to offer themselves for re-election. Auditor's tenure is often one year. So you run from when you are appointed at an AGM to the next AGM, you offer yourself to be reappointed as an auditor or called re-election. Now, if at the end of the one year, you could opt not to offer yourself for reappointment. So that is the fourth way that an auditor can depart or leave an audit client. So one way is if they decide 
to resign. There are rules go, uh, gui uh, guiding that. Second way is if the firm or the company the auditing decides to remove them, possibly for um, not uh, for the quality of the work or concerns around uh integrity or independence and and like and the like but basically looking at the quality of their work per se the third is that the company decides that they prefer another auditor and so they decide to reappoint but uh, sorry they decide to appoint or replace them with another auditor and the fourth is if the auditor decides on their own accord that at the end of our tenure we do not want to be appointed for another year. So they decide not to offer themselves up for reappoint for re-election. That's because it's required that as an auditor, if your tenure ends, you should offer yourself up for, for a reappointment for the next year. But if you decide not to, then you could actually proceed with uh, leaving the, the company. And let's also note the two key reasons why this provision of removal is important. That's the likely exam question. Two key reasons why it protects the independence of the auditor. You have a right, you can present your case if you feel aggrieved to the members, not to the management this time, but to the members. Two, it gives the owners of the business the right to decide for themselves who they want as auditors, who they believe can give them a report, credible report as to the truth and fairness of their financial statement. Let's look at the rights and responsibilities of auditors. Rights and re responsibilities of auditors. By responsibility, we're speaking to what the auditors is expected to do, what the editor's job is. By rights, we're expecting, we're looking at um, what the auditor has the power to do or what he has the power to access in the company. So let's speak, first speak to the rule or the expectation or the responsibility of the auditor. It's important when looking at this topic to consider the fact that an auditor has a primary responsibility. So what is that primary responsibility? There might be a number of sub responsibilities, sub expectation, but the primary and the key re responsibility of, a of auditors is to report to the owners of the company uh, as to whether, according to them and their review, the financial statements of the company show a true and fair view about the financial situation of the company's affairs and has been prepared in accordance with their provisions of applicable laws, such as International financial reporting standards, if that's applicable for the company, uh, international stand, uh, com the company act as, uh, as well. So it's important that the auditor provides that true and fair view. So that is the primary responsibility. That is the main responsibility of an auditor. Please take note of that. Now, in addition to this main responsibility, there are other secondary responsibility of an auditor as they carry out their work. Now, when you take a look at the company's financial statement, in, in addition to, annual reports really, in addition to the financial statement, you do have other statements in the annual report. You could possibly pick up one um, or set online for company that is listed on the stock exchange and look at the, at the annual report. You'd see some other things in there. So you could have something called director's report. You could have something called the chairman's report. So the director's report, for instance, the directors are going to speak about a number of things, okay? The economic situation in the country. They're going to speak about um, how they were able to weather the storm in the country, how they are uh, the challenges, the key challenges. And then they're going to speak about the result or the financial performance of the company. So uh, auditors are required to look at that director's report to ensure that it is consistent with the account and report the fact if it does not. So if, for instance, the report that was audited by the the company shows that uh, in, the, in, the, in the financial statement, we've seen that the company made a profit of one billion. 
but in the, the director's report, the directors mentioned that the profit was five billion. There is inconsistency. The director that so the auditors are expected to review and ensure that whatever the the the, the, the directors speak as regards the account is consistent. The auditors are not going to look at other matters in that director's statement. They are not going to look at about talk about uh, how the how the, the company, for instance, sponsored events through the year or their social responsibility actions, because that does not relate to the account. They're only looking at mention of financial uh, financial performance figures to confirm that it aligns with their review as to the truth and fairness of the financial statement. Another responsibility of the auditor is to outline in its report details of director's remuneration, loans to officers, transactions involving directors and other connected persons, if not disclosed in the financial statement. And so it is expected that in the financial statement um, that you have details as to the remuneration or the salary or the pay of the key management employee, the directors, um, the management staff really. If it is not stated, the auditor will ensure that that is that is imputed or that is actually captured in his uh, in his report, and that is important so that people get to know uh, what the, the pay is for the for those um, top um, that with directors and officers of the company. The officer might also be required. The direct the auditors might also be required to make some other reports or to review some other reports that are related to the financial. Statement. So some other report. So that's not uh, 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 conclusive, really. Another requirement is that from auditors is that whenever this, they decide to seize office, we've mentioned this, they should make a statement of circumstance. Statement of circumstance. A statement of circumstance, like we mentioned, speaks to the reasons, the factors that, that uh, prompted their decision to resign. And if there is anything they believe to be brought to the attention of those to whom they are meant to report, and primarily that report, that should go, that should be the owners of the business, the shareholders of the business. So that those are the responsibilities of the auditor. Group that into two: primary responsibility, which is the first one, and then other responsibility, which is uh, number two to five. So let's look at the rights of an auditor. What powers the auditors has as they go on with their responsibility. The first right of an auditor is the right of access at all times to books of account and vouchers of the company. So as auditors, the company cannot deny you access to whatever records require for your audit. So if you go and then um, you would see that they bought, for instance, they claim to have bought an asset or an equipment for say $5 billion recorded in the account, you have a right to request to see the asset. You have a right to request to see the contract to purchase that document. You have a right to request for the company's correspondence with the seller of that document. So anything you require for your for the audit work, you have a right to get it. So if the audit client begins to deny you access, then that raises some issue because it could be said that they are trying to limit the scope of your work, which is called scope creep. As a, as and auditors well, you also have a right to acquire from the officers, including the directors of the company, such information and explanations as are deemed necessary for the performance of the job as an auditor. So you have a right to ask questions. You have a right to say you want to see the CEO or you want to communicate or make some inquiry from the CEO. 
or any officer of the company. So the CEO or the top management or cannot say that uh, they are so busy as not to answer the questions or inquiry from the auditors. They have that right. A third right which an auditor has is the right to attend any general meeting of the company and to receive notice of and communications related to any general meeting on any part of the business that is discussing matters which concern them as auditors. And so if there's going to be a meeting and the part of an, an agenda on that meeting speaks to the auditor, speaks to appointment or their appointment or their remuneration or their remuneration or matters around their work, um, the auditor has the right to attend that meeting and speak for themselves. So those are some of the key rights of the auditors. Other rights include the right to apply to the court for directions in relation to any matters arising in connection with the performance of their functions. So as an auditor, if you feel that there's an issue that requires legal redress, there's a concern around your contract or engagement with the audit client that warrants going to court, it's important that the, uh, it's important to know that as an auditor, you have that uh, right, as long as it relates to the performance of your work. As long as it relates to the performance of your work. Another right the auditor has relates to the power to communicate with a retiring auditor. So that by retiring auditor, we mean if you're coming in as a new auditor, for an existing company, you're most likely coming in to replace an officer that is retiring or the officer has left or is leaving. So that is called a retiring officer. The officer that an incoming auditor is coming to replace is called a retiring officer. Oh, sorry, a retiring auditor. So as an auditor, the, the new auditor, you have a right to communicate with the previous auditor because it is really proper and it's required really that you communicate with the, with the retiring auditor because you want to know if there are any issues that might affect your, your work and if there are any issues that you need to consider before accepting the engagement. Think of it this way, that you applied for a job and uh, you have this opportunity to speak to someone who has left the company. That is something you would take, you would, want, you, you would want to miss because that gives you a good idea around how you operate in that company you're moving into. Um, and if there are any issues or concerns that you think might impact on you accepting the job that has been offered to you. So the, officer, the auditors, the incoming auditors have that right to communicate with a retiring, with a retiring auditor before accepting appointment as auditor of a company. The auditor also has a right to contract with the company in addition to their statutory duties to the members of the company expressly or by implication or to undertake obligations to the company in relation to the detection of defications and advice on accounting, taxation, raising of finance and other matters. So in addition to your work as auditors, you have a right to be considered for other engagement that will not impact, impact on your independence, on independence in carrying out your audit work. As long as you're able to provide adequate um, safeguards, you have a right to be considered for other engagements in the company. So those are the rights of an auditor. And so once any of these rights is breached, or then it becomes the concern because the law provides for those rights. And so that's why it's important that we consider the regulatory framework of auditing. So regulatory framework, we're talking about the laws, the rules guiding the audit profession. So that helps you get, um, know what your rights are and know what your responsibilities are as you carry on work as auditors. 
The next section we want to look at is on code of conduct and ethics. So basically, we're looking at um, the code of conduct. When you say code of conduct, we're looking at um, rules, principles regarding the conduct or the behavior of those who are auditors. So the company law has some requirements regarding how auditors should behave. The first code we will consider is the principle of due scale, care, and competence. So there are three words there, due scale, due scale. That is required scale. Second point, second, second part of our principle is care. So care speaks to being careful, care and competence. You're careful and you know what you are doing. So let's speak to these principles because these are very important and expected behavior of those who are appointed as auditor. So the auditor is required to attain and maintain professional knowledge at scale at the level required to ensure that a client or employing organization receives competent professional service based on current technical and professional standards and relevant legislation. So as an auditor, you need to have the required knowledge and skills. And this required knowledge and skills has to be current. It has to be current. For example, if you're an auditor, you know that financial statement has to be prepared in line with the international financial reporting standard in most countries. And these standards are subject to updates. They are subject to changes. So if you, if you had read and you are confident or you knew the standard, say in year 2000, that knowledge will no longer be relevant for audit today because the rules have changed for some of the, so some of the, of the standards. The requirement has changed. The laws around company operations, the preparation of financial statements has changed. So you need to ensure that your knowledge is current. It is um, current. Both your technical knowledge and your knowledge on standards and regulation by, by the country. It's also important that auditors provide quality service to their clients. Quality service. So you cannot do careless work. So that is why the requirement there is due skill then care care you need to carefully perform your work so that you you can render quality service the degree of skills and care you require for work for your early work depends on the type of work you're required to do please take note of that so i'll take that again the degree of skills and care required depends on the type of work they are required to do. So for instance, someone who is in the medical profession, you know that it requires a high degree of skill and competence because <laughs> any mistake or, or, or negligence or forgetting to do something can lead to the death of a patient. You can't compare that the level of care required to someone who is who is who does something something else, who is possibly a marketer or who does who does marketing really. The, the degree of care required is different. So it is with the audit profession. So if you're doing a specialized job, so by a specialized job I mean something that um, doesn't requires special kind of skills and knowledge that doesn't have a, a standardized method of accomplishing it. So for instance, you're gonna do due diligence and investigation review. Now for due diligence and investigation review, you know that the, your approach depends on what you're investigating. 
and the parties involved. So that will require a higher level of skill and due care compared to when you are doing your regular audit. For regular audit, for audit, for, for auditor, that is our primary responsibility. So we get to perform audit regularly. So with time, we know the in and out of audit. There are standards to help to guide us. There are frameworks to guide us. So we really don't have much challenge with that. So the so degree of care, the degree of skills required really is, is less compared to specialized work. Now, another factor that determines the degree of skills and care required, it's where negligence is likely to cause high loss to the company. So two key factors determine the level of skills and care you require. One, the nature of the work, which is the, the most specialized a job is, a review is, the higher the degree of skills and care required. Two, the, the loss you would suffer if there is negligence. So if you're doing a review on the, you're doing re review on receipt, and possibly you're looking at receipt around a company procuring notebooks, just, uh, just as stationary, you know, that's possibly you add up everything, it doesn't, it doesn't go more than uh, 20,000, 10,000. Um, the level of care or skills required for that review will be different from if you're doing a review around um, a contract that is worth 10 billion. So if you suffer, if that review would lead to substantial loss, if you don't uh, do it well, that requires a higher level of skills and, uh, and care as well. So take note of those two factors really that determine the degree of skills and care required in the conduct of audit. Now, let's take note that as auditors, despite the fact that the rule requires that we, 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 ex we, we display due skills, care, and competence, that does not mean that auditors are infallible. In other words, it does not mean that auditors are expected to be perfect. No. But rather, what is expected from auditors is that they, ex they, they do their work with reasonable care. So reasonable care would mean that the, pros the, the, the procedure you undertake to conduct that review, if you are to give that work to five auditor other auditors to do, about four of them will do the same thing as we did. So that shows that you took reasonable care in the conduct of that audit. But if you did the job and then that job or that review is given to the other auditors and out of the five auditors, just one auditor was satisfied or did that level of work we did, they didn't, go up, didn't go beyond the level of work we did, then that would not be considered reasonable care. So reasonable care is what is expected of auditor. And reasonable care implies that if similar, a professional should agree with the level of work you have done. In the course of the audit, if auditors come across any matter when they're carrying out the audit, which, put, which puts them on inquiry, they have a duty to investigate such a matter to a reasonable and satisfactory conclusion. Auditors should not accept any explanation unless they have carried out such out such investigations as will enable them draw their own conclusions and form their own judgment. So what does that mean? As an auditor, you go into a company, conduct a review, and you would notice that um, there is a revenue or income that is posted for one million. You ask the you ask the management or the finance team. Is there any explanation on this revenue? And they tell you, oh, there's a contract that we had with Mr. B. As auditors, you are expected to go further. You are expected not to take their word from face value, because as auditors, we are expected to display what is called professional skepticism. They expected to question 
that statement or that oral statement uh, evidence provided by the audit client. So you expect it to go a step further by asking for documents. You expect it to look at, okay, what's the contract? Um, what's agreed on? What's been signed on? And you might even sometimes, depending on the value, want to even speak with the person that that sales was made to. So you need to carry out your own review and form conclusion based on your own review rather than on oral statement or testimony. And so that, 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 that means that professional skepticism or having a question in mind is the key element of due care. Now, what if an auditor does not have the skills, the knowledge, the competence to undertake an engagement that they've been offered? So an audit client comes to you and says, we've noticed fraud through our computer system, and we need you to audit it. But as an audit client, you don't have the knowledge you don't have the skills to undertake system-related investigation. What should you do? If you don't have the skills, do not accept. Except you can do two things. One, except you are able to obtain the needed advice and assistance that will enable you to carry that work out in a competent manner. So if you don't have the necessary advice, necessary assistance, do not accept the job. That is a potential exam question. So how do you get the necessary advice and assistance? So if you don't, if you have a job to perform and you don't know how it is done, there are basically two options. For you or basically three options for you for really three options for you one is because you don't have the knowledge and skills you decide not to accept that offer the second option is you decide to employ an expert someone knowledgeable in the field or in that area to carry out that work for you and the third option is you decide to embark or train, embark on the training, seek training opportunities to develop your competence in that area. Now, if you can't get an expert and you can't develop yourself, have the network, ensure that you have the necessary training and skills to be able to do that job, you have to reject that engagement. That is the regulation on conduct of a job or a review which the auditor is not competent as at the time the offer is made. Please take note of that. Let's look at a second principle relating to the conduct or behavior that is expected of auditors. And that is the principle of integrity. The principle of integrity requires that an auditor has to be straightforward, honest, and open in all professional and business relationship. So if an auditor tells you it is A, it should, it should be A. It should be the truth. So they should be what? They should be honest. An auditor should be open, meaning they shouldn't hide anything which could uh, impact on their work or that's related to their work, as long as it doesn't breach the confidentiality uh, rule, which we speak about um, the, uh, later on. So they should be open, they should be plain, they should come out plain, and they should be straightforward in their dealing. So integrity basically means fair dealing and truthfulness. What you say is the truth. You are not biased towards any party or anybody. That is the requirement as it pertains integrity. 
auditors should strive for objectivity in all professional and business judgment. So objectivity basically is the state of mind with regards to the work you're undertaking. So you're not biased towards a particular uh, action. You're not biased towards a particular review. Take for instance, if you're going to review a company and you're conducting a review of a company, and then in the conduct in the process of review, you have um, a, a close family member working in the company, and you discover that um, there are fraudulent activities in the company. But then you're concerned that if you report it, it might lead to the sack of that close family member. That can impact your objectivity. So you become biased in the conduct of the audit. Auditors are not expected to be biased. Auditors should not be biased. And so as auditors, an auditor should not knowingly be associated with any report, returns, communication, or any information that is believed to contain the following. One, a materially false or misleading statement. So as auditors, your name should not be mentioned around issue of false or issuing false or misleading statement. Statement or information provided recklessly. And also, you should not be involved in Omitting or obscuring required information, we are doing that would be misleading or lead to the people that, that, that those that rely on the report making wrong decision. Be straightforward, be honest, be open. That is the principle of integrity. A third principle, code of conduct, behavior expected of auditor is the professional duty of confidentiality. That's confidentiality. Confidentiality. Professional duty of confidentiality. This requires that as accountants, uh, being auditors, that we should respect the confidentiality of information that were provided in the course of conducting our audit work. And that's because as auditors, we have access to a lot of information, information about the company's revenue, how they make money, information around about their strategy for making more money. And even in the course of your work, you might get access to confidential information about what the company's plan for the future is. And so whatever information you acquire, this is the rule, you should neither use or appear to use that information for your personal advantage or for the advantage of a third party. So let's say you, because of your audit as an auditor, you discover that um, a company is planning to acquire another company next year. And you know very well that um, that acquisition will increase the value of that company and will lead to an increase in the share price as soon as it is announced. But as of now, the company is still having that negotiation, that, uh, that discussion in-house, and they have not made that information public. Can you base on that information go and buy shares of that company in expectation that by the time the information is known or made public or the acquisition takes place and the share price increases, you can sell it and make good profit? No. That would be a breach of the auditor's professional duty of confidentiality. What if um, that information that you got yourself, okay, I know the, 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 I, I'm, I'm not meant to use this for my personal gain because it's not a public knowledge. But then you go out with some friends, you're hanging out with some friends, and you tell them, ah, I did the audit of this company. Do you know that they're trying to acquire ABC? 
and those friends, based on that information, go and buy the shares of that company. That is also a breach of your responsibility or your professional duty of confidentiality. You do not disclose information about the company that you gathered in the course of your audit to outsiders, to third parties. You do not use that information for your own personal gain or for, a, for the advantage of others, be it friends, be it uh, family members, that is wrong. It is improper. Or what if you go to audit and in the course of your audit, let's say you're auditing a company and a pharmaceutical company, and in the course of your audit, you discover that um, the drug that the company is producing is harmful can cause serious health concern, say liver, liver damage. You discover that in the course of your audit. Does this rule on confidentiality apply? Or say you do in the course of your audit, you discover that the company, uh, when you're looking at the report, you notice that part of their finance, the finance, finance or fund, goes to financing terrorism. And then you remember that uh, as an auditor, you have a professional duty of confidentiality. Does that apply? No. That's because there are exceptions to the rule on confidentiality. Please pay close attention to these exceptions because um, Looking at past questions, there have been a number of questions around this rule. So when can an auditor disclose information that they gather in the course of their review? One is where the auditor has obtained the consent of the client to disclose the information. So this will really involve you telling the company uh, Possibly you have a request from outside to provide some information that is, um, and you need to get that out. You seek the permission or the approval of the company you're auditing. If they say yes to it, you can go ahead and disclose. If they say no to it, you are not expected to disclose. However, there are exceptions. If in the course of your audit, you find out that the client has committed offense related to treason, terrorism, drugs, or money laundering in general, as auditors, you're obliged to disclose all information at your disposal to a competent authority. The word there is you are required, you are mandated, if you find out that your audit client is involved in any of these activities, money laundering, drugs, terrorism, treason, you should report it to a competent authority. The laws of most countries speaks to the fact that things of this nature, auditors should report it to specific um, re regulatory authorities. So in this case, you don't need the auditor's consent to disclose that information because it is required by law. In addition to that, if there is a third exception to the rule really is if there is a material non-compliance with laws and regulation. We we'll speak a little bit more about the auditor's um, responsibility with regards to this later on. But just take note that the auditor is required to consider whether any non-compliance with laws and regulations affect the financial statement. Where it does, the auditor is required to include this in his report. If such would lead to a material, if such would materially impact the financial statement. 
So the auditor is expected to include in his report a statement as to whether that non compliance has led to a significant uncertainty or that non compliance means that the auditor disagrees with the way certain items have been treated in the account. So you do a review and you find out that the company has breached a particular law. And then you review the penalties for breach. And then you notice that ah, when a company breaches this law, one of the key penalties is that its license will be revoked and the company would cease to operate. It's expected that that disclosure be made in the financial statement. Or you, you because of reviewing financial statement, you notice that the rules around how um, certain transactions should be treated was not followed. The rules around, for instance, how do you treat your, um, your depreciation or your capital allowance in computing your tax, stuff like that. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't adhered to. So, so you, so because of that now, the, the figure you have in the financial statement that were treated, that were, com were computed based on that, it's not true and fair. And so if you disagree, you feel that because of the way it's been treated or non-compliance, you disagree with the way that item is treated and it's material to the financial statement, it's important to disclose it in the financial statement. A key point to note there is materiality. So when it comes to non-compliance with laws and regulations that affect the financial statement, it's important to note that our focus is on material items or items that materially impact the financial statement. A third, a fourth, sorry, exception to that rule is where is the fact that an auditor has a public duty to disclose matters of public interest. So just like the case we mentioned where an auditor goes in and notices that the pharmaceutical company is producing drugs and these drugs is poisonous, it's harmful. So that has an impact on the public. So as an auditor, you have that obligation or that moral obligation to disclose that finding. So the confidentiality rule does not apply to this. A fifth exception to the confidentiality rule is where disclosure is compelled by law. For example, if there is a court judgment or a court, court proceeding and the auditor is asked to come and give evidence, you are required as an auditor to provide the required information truthfully because it is compelled by law. And so it will be a criminal offense for an auditor to act positively without lawful authority or reasonable excuse in such a manner as to impede with intent the arrest or prosecution of a client whom he knows or believes to have committed an offense calling for arrest. So as auditors, you can't defend the audit client if he's broken the law. So you've, in the course of your review, you've noticed that the company makes transfer to a board or funding terrorism, makes transfer to bodies or terror, terrorist organization. And then the auditor, the company is under investigation. And then the, the owners of the business come in and say, oh, that thing you, you saw, and please, we need to we need to capture it that the, when you did your review, the phone were actually transferred for something else, so that we don't get arrested. As auditors, we need to be honest, we need to be open, and we need to comply with the law 
So we are required to disclose truthfully information that is required by law. We do not want to be a party to, to obstruction of justice. Let's look at another set of code. And this time we're looking at auditor's responsibility for objectivity and independence. Starting with objectivity. The principle of objectivity requires an auditor not to compromise professional or business judgment because of bias, conflict of interest, or undue influence of others. We do not want our work, our review to be biased. Or possibly because you as an, as an auditor, you have shares in that company. So you want them to report as much profit as possible so that you can get dividend. And then in the course of your review, you've noticed that uh, there are some items that were not treated correctly. And uh, if they were to correct that false treatment, the company profit will turn to a loss and dividend will not be paid. So there's that conflict between what you would love to have and what it should be the right thing to do. So we should never allow that in the course of our duty. We should not also allow our work to be influenced by others. So you're going to audit and uh, your brother is a key member of the company. You want to believe oral statement from a brother because you feel that he's a family member. If you do that, your work is being unduly influenced by others. So the principle of objectivity requires that auditors should, in carrying out their, their work, should not be biased, should be free from conflict of interest, and should not allow any undue influence on their work. So what if an auditor or an accountant in, in offered their, is offered a, an audit work and notices that there are some actions that could influence their judgment, what should they do? Just like in the case of um, due care, skills, and competence will be considered, an auditor, shall, an auditor shall not undertake a professional activity if a circumstance or relationship in unduly influences their professional judgment regarding that activity as auditors or as accountants because uh, as auditors we actually professionally we are accountants as well so you should not undertake any activity if you believe that a particular relationship or a particular situation will impact on your professional judgment so um, if it's an audit firm, for instance, and then on the audit team, you have an audit partner or an audit manager that is related to the company. The proper thing to do is to replace that audit partner. So that auditor should not be involved in that, uh, in that review or the auditor has a significant shareholding, significant shares in that company. The auditor should not be involved in the audit because that situation would have undue influence on the work he is to undertake. So what are some of the things that could impact or could serve as a threat to auditor's objectivity? There are several, but the key principle there is that anything, any circumstance, any situation that you think would make you to be biased towards your review would impact on your objectivity. So that's the that's the, the key principle. And that is a test, the lithium test, when you are evaluating a particular situation or circumstance. 
So let's look at some of some threats to auditors' objectivity, both at um, a company level in terms of the audit firm level, at and at individual level in terms of the individuals that are form part of um, the audit team. So the first stress to objectivity is on due dependence on an audit client. As audit firm, we are there to make money. We need the money to ensure that we're able to pay the salary of the auditors that work in the audit firm. However, if all your income is coming from one or two, a few, let's say two, three um, companies, you will not want to lose your source of income. So that will impact on your objectivity because you might be concerned, you'd feel that if I annoy this client, I get, I make, I make, I make, I make 1 billion in a year and I get 800 billion from Mr. John. I'll be concerned when I'm working for Mr. John. I wouldn't want to offend Mr. John because I know that if I offend Mr. John, he could decide to remove me as auditors. And that would mean that I lose that major source of income. So if you find yourself in that situation as an audit firm, that's a threat to your objectivity. And that threat is called a self-interest threat. So what are the rules to prevent such a threat? The rules is that for recurring work, the fee for recurring work for a client or a group of connected clients should not exceed 15% of the gross practice income. So for a company that you've, you audit regularly, you've audited year one, year two, it's recurring, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a recurring work for that client, Let's say your income for the year is 100, to keep it simple. That shows, says that, that rule says that any income you're making from any of your client, recurring client, should not be more than 15. So if I have a job, and uh, let's say my total income is, uh, let's, uh, let's leave it at that 200, and I have a job from someone, and that person is going to pay me Take that will be a breach of that the, the, the rule on the gross practice income as it relates to audit client. But let's also note that this rule of 15% is if the client is not listed on the stock exchange. Where the company is listed on the stock exchange. The figure drops further to 10%. So for companies listed on the stock exchange, your, the income you are getting from them as fees should not be more than 10% of your total income as an audit firm for a year. However, if your audit firm is new, just, just, start, just a startup, it might be difficult, really, because at the first year, you're trying to market yourself, trying to get clients in. So in such a situation, in that, that situation might be really be difficult for you to satisfy, satisfy this requirement. So in that, in, in that case, it's important to ensure that whatever engagement you undertake, you put in place safeguards, appropriate safeguards to protect your independence and objectivity. So let's take that again. Your income from any company that is listed on the stock exchange should not be more than 10% of your total gross practice income. For any company that is listed on a stock exchange, if the company is not listed, then you're permitted to have as much as to go in as much as 15% of your gross practice income. Anything outside that would impact, would likely impact on your objectivity. 
a second threat to auditor's objectivity is overdue fees. So by overdue fees, we mean work, you've done the work, but you've not been paid. So you have this work, this um, fee that's been accumulated over a number of years. So year one, they own you, year two, they own you, maybe year three, they pay you one year, owe you a part of it. So when you have these overdue fees with the audit client, it could also impact on your objectivity. So this could be likened to that of a loan. So let's assume that you have someone who is owing you an amount of money, material amount of money really, say 10 billion, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so you want this person to pay. Now, if you hear that the person is sick, you most likely be concerned, you'll be worried. You wouldn't want anything to happen to that person because you want your money back. You have an interest in the well-being of that person. You don't want a person to go out of business because if they go out of business, there's no way you get your money back. So when you have such overdue fees, it can threaten the objectivity. You can threaten your approach to the audit work because you know very well that if the company goes out of business or something harmful happens to the company, you might not get your feedback. So to control this, firms must ensure that overdue fees along with fees from current work should not be constructed as a loan. Overdue fees could also be considered a seven threat threat. A third threat to auditors' objectivity is where you have actual or threatened litigation. So we're talking about litigation, we're speaking to court action. So the auditor threatens you with court action, threatens you, I'm going to sue you for this, I'm going to sue you for that, I'm going to sue you for that. But the auditor actually takes you to court. That impact on your objectivity because if the auditor is threatening you you would want to you would want to especially if you feel that possibly it relates to the quality of your work or something around that you would want to maintain that relationship you wouldn't want to make the the the, the, the you wouldn't want the, the audit client to be annoyed with you but along with that it is important to state that when you have such threats to objectivity and uh, such threats of legal action, that could result in the breakdown of trust between the auditor and the audit client. Please take note of that. Where there are cases of actual or threatened litigation, that can result in breakdown of trust. And when there is a breakdown of trust, it impacts on the independence of the auditor. Or, the, or call even causes the directors of the client to become unwilling to disclose information to the auditor. So, threat of litigation causes breakdown of trust. The auditor's independence in bar is impaired. The directors were struggling to provide the required information to the auditors. There is an exception really which you need to take note of. A dispute which is only in relation to audit fees may not cause such a problem. So let's assume that the audit claim, it's the client has been owing you fees for a number of years and you decide to sue them for that. That would not impact on your objectivity. That's very important. Now, what type of threat would we call litigation, especially when it is coming from the client? So that would be an intimidation threat because if the, if the, court, if the, if the client is telling you, remember how you meant to do this last time, you didn't do it this way or that, I'm going to sue you. They're basically trying to intimidate you to cave into their wishes and their, and their requests. So that would be called intimidation threat. A fourth threat to objectivity of an auditor 
relates to family and personal relationship. This can have an undue influence on decisions relating to the affected party. The problem would often arise if an officer or senior employee of an audit is closely connected with the partner or senior staff members responsible for the conduct of the audit. So basically, if senior officers really of the audit client, really, senior officers, the employees of the audit client, if they're related to those senior of partners or senior staff members for the audit, that will impact on objectivity. So let's say that the audit, the audit team, a partner or a manager has an in-law who is the CEO of the company they are auditing. Obviously, that audit, that audit partner or manager will not want to annoy his in-law. He wants to maintain that relationship. So that familiarity will, might, actually, might actually impact on the auditor's professional skepticism because the auditor might not question everything that the, the, the that, that, that relative brings up because of that relationship, that familiarity that exists between them. And so that is why it is called what? Familiarity thread. Now, for this to really be an issue, for this to really be an issue, the audit staff involved should be a partner or a senior staff member. So if, for instance, in that audit team, you have a junior. So a junior is the, the lowest ranked member of an audit team, really. So you have a junior and he's working just to go and uh, cash, confirm a few things, count this, count that. He's not responsible for making decisions. He's not responsible for high risk area. Whatever decision the junior makes, whatever this uh, outcome for a junior's work might really not impact on the materiality of the financial statement. It might really not impact because they are subsequent reviews by other members of the audit team. So in that case, that might not be a familiarity threat. Familiarity threat would only arise where senior employees, senior employees, management staff, or officers of the organization you are auditing are related to senior the partner or senior members of the audit theme that is conducting that audit. So what type of relationship are we looking at? So in this context, closely connected people would include one, you're looking at auditor's children, spouse, siblings and their spouse. In other words, any relative to whom re regular financial is give, assistance is given or who is indebted to the staff member or partner. So that gives rise to familiarity thread. And so that is why as, as audit firms, when they, con when, when, they, when, they, when, they, when they want to conduct an audit, they would often ask members of the team if they have any relationship with employees in that organization. So that helps them to decide on who should be a member of the audit team. And so the company code prevents an officer or employee of the company from becoming an auditor of that company. The statement extends this prohibition for its members to two years after ceasing to be an officer or employee of the company. So even if you've left, so I used to work for company A and you've decided to leave company A to join an audit firm, you cannot immediately become an auditor of that company A that you left. That's because that relationship with your, your previous employer, the previous colleague is in there. So the law provides that you should not audit them for a minimum of two years. It is expected that after that two years, some of that relationship would have weighed out and uh, you've been able to, you can now independently conduct that, uh, that, uh, that, that review. Another threat to objectivity is beneficiary interest in shares and other investments. So we discussed this earlier. If you have shares in a company, you want the company to do well because you want dividend. So 
you might be biased which, which, when you see something that might lead to them declaring loss. So you don't want that to happen. Um, another um, sixth term threat is if you have some level of association uh, from outside practice or outside sources. So if firm's objectivity may be threatened or appear to be threatened as a result of pressure arising from associated practices or organizations or from external sources such as bankers, solicitors, government, or those introducing business. So for instance, as an audit firm, someone introduced you to the client and you don't want to um you want to maintain that relationship to the person that introduced you to the other client so you want so that to, to that will impact on how objective and fair you are because you'll be concerned that if you were to do certain things certain way that relationship or you might not be introduced to further business uh, from that particular um source another thread is provision of other services so if you conduct, for instance, the audit client, the client meets you and say, come and prepare our account for us. And you know that as auditors, your responsibility was actually, is actually meant to express an opinion on the report that has been prepared by management of the company, by directors of the company. But this time they say, we'd come and prepare this account for us. So if you're responsible for preparing the account for the company, when you're auditing it, you will not be objective because you wouldn't want to point out errors in an account that you prepared <laughs> yourself. So what are some of the actions or review procedures that audit firms can put in place with regards to integrity, objectivity, and independence? It is expected that audit firms should understand that this threat exists. And every audit firm actually has that, uh, has that realization that there is the likelihood that there's a threat to our objectivity, there's a threat to our independence. So audit firms establish certain procedures, review procedures to guard against loss of objectivity and independence. Some of these procedures might actually include, um, for some firms, really, before I go into that, for some firms, really, they have like this annual review of their audit client, their, their reviews through the year, just a second review, just to ensure that uh, there's no threat to objectivity in their work. So what are some of the things audit firms do? One, they ensure that those they have in an audit team, that they are qualified. They have the necessary skills and they have the necessary experience. They have the necessary competence and they are ethical. That's one thing audit firms do to guard against issues from integrity, objectivity, and independence. The second thing is they ensure regular rotation of engagement partners and senior members of staff. Um, if you remember from our previous lecture, we spoke about engagement partners. So engagement partner is actually the, the member of the audit team who is responsible for the issue of the audit report and ensuring that all reviews that are meant to take place or to be undertaken are actually undertaken. Let's discuss the procedures for the appointment of external auditors. We've spoken about, in the course of this, um, this session, we've spoken about um, the appointment of auditors um, in terms of, uh, in terms of by the company itself, really. We've spoken about um, um, the removal and resignation of auditors. So this time we're gonna speak about procedures for appointment of external auditors from the, from the angle of the auditors themselves, not from the angle of the company really, but from the angle of the auditors themselves. What are the procedures they're gonna take um, before accepting an audit engagement with, the, with a company? First is that it's important for an audit firm to undertake what is called a client screening. So when you see you're screening something, you're looking through it, checking it, 
to see if there are any issues you should be aware of or anything you need to take out of what you're screening. And so some potential auditors would often go through the screening process before accepting any offer of appointment. Why is this necessary? This is to safeguard against the auditor suffering considerable adverse publicity or possible legal actions for associating with dubious clients. Please take note of those two reasons why an audit firm should screen whoever is coming to appoint them as auditors. One, it protects you against negative publicity. Because if you don't know who you are, who you are going in with, and you end up with a dubious client, company that has negative records, it will impact on your reputation. It will impact on your name and your, and your profession as well. So you could have that negative publicity as well. Second thing is, if you go into working with a client that is known to be involved in dubious activities, money laundering and the like, uh, a client that hides records from auditors, when there are legal actions against that company, the auditors will be called in. And they might even be part of those that are sued okay, because they are auditors. So come and explain why you didn't detect this uh, material um, deviation or gap in the financial and uh, the financial statement. So that is the reason why it's important that the screening process takes place. And so this screening process therefore aims at, uh, aims at identifying risk associated with accepting the offer of a particular client and to access the level of control. So after you've conducted your audit screening, the end result of that screening is you need to make a decision as to whether you would accept the offer or not. If you decide to accept the offer, then it becomes necessary for you to formalize the terms of that engagement and have it documented and signed off in a letter of engagement. So we'll speak to two things right now. We'll discuss two main things now. One is, how do you conduct client screening? And two is, what is a letter of engagement? What are the expected contents in a letter of engagement? First, let's look at screening. So you have this audit client. Uh, sorry, this audit client, yes. This company comes to you as an audit company and say, we want to appoint you, or we have an interest in appointing you as our auditor. What are some checks or client screening you can undertake before giving a response to that company as to whether you accept or you want to decline their offer to serve as their auditor? There are a number of criteria. One is called pre accepting condition. So before you accept an offer of appointment, you should ensure as an auditor that the principles of integrity, objectivity, independence, and other ethical requirements are not compromised. So you want to look at it and say, is there any circumstance any situation or any relationship between my audit firm and this company that is approaching us to serve as the auditors that will impact on our independence, on our objectivity, on our integrity as an audit firm? Do we have the necessary competence, the necessary skills to conduct that audit? So, you need to ensure that this is not compromised before you consider moving forward. You also need to ensure that as auditors, 
you've been appointed in a proper manner with reference, particular reference to taking over from a retiring auditor by communicating with a retiring officer with the aim of discussing issues relating to the client. So we've looked at, if we look at the procedures for removal of an auditor. So you want to ensure that that procedures, especially if you are replacing, when you are replacing someone really, not when you are the first auditor of the company, when you are replacing someone, you need to ensure that that procedure was followed in the removal of the previous auditor. And that will require that you communicate with that previous auditor. So we'll discuss about the requirement for communicating with the auditor shortly. Second set of reviews we want to do is to look at ethical consideration, specific issues around threat subjectivity. So you look at, is the fee from the job greater than 15% of the audit firm's gross fees for the year. So if you audit fee for, for the year, or you could use the previous year as benchmark, what say 100. And the company approaching you, the fee for that work is 40. That's 40%. That is above the recommended fees from a single client. Now this 15% is if that company is not listed on the stock exchange. If the company is listed on the stock exchange, the rate will be 10%. So if it's above, if the fee from that engagement is above 10% of your gross fee for the year, you should not accept that engagement. You should also consider potential conflict of interest and other threats to objectivity and independence. So we've considered some of those threats to objectivity. So you want to review them as an audit firm and see if any of those threats impacts, would impact on your performance of that audit, both at the firm and at individual auditors level. So things like personal relationship, investment in the company that we've considered. You also need to consider in the screening process that you've met as auditors, the requirement, the legal requirement to act as an auditor. So what are the legal requirements? One is that auditor must be member of a recognized professional body or a recognized professional accountant in the host country. And then the auditors should not be an employee of the company being audited, should be an employee. And even if they are an ex-employee, remember that law says that should have a cool off period of two years. So after you've left the company, join an audit firm, you can only bid an audit of that company after, after two years, after a two year period, very important. A fourth screening criteria consideration, it's called practical consideration. By practical, we mean this is now related to the job itself. So the auditor must ensure that the firm's existing resources so the materials, the manpower, the equipment, everything you require to conduct the audit, that they are adequate to service the needs of the new client. This raises questions of staff and time availability and technical expertise. So there are two considerations there around um, resources, really. One is that you have technical expertise, you have the knowledge, you have the skills, you have people that have the knowledge and the skills to do that job. And the second thing is that those people are available to do the job. So if, if for instance, you have um, 10 audit, audit firm and you require five per audit, 
and you've had you have um, the auditors the auditors engage in all of the engagement and possibly you can only bring in record two out of this engagement or something because they're running up even though they have the skills but they are not sufficient they're not enough they don't have the available time they're not available to conduct that audit so it's important that you have the skills and you the audit the the relevant auditors are available now if you do not have the skills or expertise or resources, the audit firm is required to reject the offer. However, like we discussed, there are two, ex there are two other exceptions to rejecting it. There are two ways around it when you do not have the skills or expertise. So it's either you bring in an expert. So if at the time the offer is made, you don't have the skills, you can quickly bring in experts to conduct that audit. Secondly, you can take advantage of training opportunity to upscale. As long as you know and you show that that training give the, the auditor the required competence to conduct that, um, that, um, that audit. The auditor may also consider the level of audit fees vis-a-vis -vis the risk associated with the engagement. The auditor may decline to accept the offer if the fees cannot match with the associated risk. You know, it's often said that the higher the risk, the higher the return. So if as an audit firm, if you're auditing a firm, a company that has a turnover of a hundred billion, you cannot compare the risk and the level of work for that, for that review with if you're auditing a company with a revenue turnover of a hundred million compared to a hundred billion. So it's only natural and it's only expected that that review where the firm has a turnover of a hundred billion should be higher than a review where the turnover is a hundred million. So you need to compare the fees against the risk. And if it's not, if it doesn't match, then you may have to decline the offer. A fifth screening consideration is for the audit firm to seek reference about the client. So the audit firm is expected to get certain information sufficient enough to enable them to identify and appraise issues that impact on the business of the client. So there's certain information you need to get. And this information could be grouped into two. One, it's a group called general information. So for every audit engagement, you need to try and get yourself abreast with this information. A second set, it's for new clients. So there's specific information you need to get and review if that audit client, that company, that's the first time they're going to be appointed to act as their auditor. And then there are certain information you need to get every year or each time you are, you, are, you are appointed to serve as their auditors subsequently. So we'll start with general information. So this is applicable to both new and existing clients. So you, as an audit firm, you need to get information about the general economic environment, the way in terms of uh, key economic indices, really. You need to look at the risk that are peculiar to that industry. So for instance, if you audit in a bank, you know that banks would often do cash-based transactions. So there's a risk around cash theft, risk around cash misappropriation. And then you also know that for some company like a pharmaceutical company that issue drugs, they're highly regulated. And any breach of this regulation could lead to their fi fines or seizure of their, of their of the license. So you want to look at some of those risks or conditions that impact, uh, that affect the client uh, business. And then you need to look at the client industry really. Then you need to look at the entity then itself now at entity level. So first you're looking at general factor, then you're looking at the industry as a whole. And then next you're looking at the entity or the company itself. So you want to look at the products, how does it make money? How does it get supplies? 
um, what are the key expense, uh, how is how is the operation of the company structured, um, and how have they been performing over the years? So that gives you an idea around them. Some expectation when you start reviewing the current year's um, financial statement. You also want to look at the regulatory environment. Um, so what are some of the laws, the key laws that the company is expected to comply with in the area it, uh, it operates? Now, for new clients, there are some additional information that are required, like I mentioned earlier. So first, you need to communicate with the previous auditor. Um, we're going to we'll, we'll speak to some, this communication um, shortly. Secondly, you might need to make inquiry from the prospective client bankers, solicitors, underwriters, and registrar, just to have a feel around their operations and, uh, and how they, they are perceived by these external parties. You also want to look at the prior year financial statement to see if in the previous year, the auditors that been there before now, and what's how the, the audit report been like? Do we have audit reports that are qualified where we have um, issues that have not been resolved from pre previous audits? So once you see a report that has issues, that gives you, that prompts you to want to do a further review to be sure that uh, that is the client that you really want to work you want to work for. Then you want to look at uh, rules, regulation, and standards governing that company. Very, very important, as well as the industry as well. And then you also want to know who the key members of the companies are. So you look for at the directories of incorporated companies to see who the key members are, who the key directors are, and who you would be communicating with uh, when you move into uh, when you take on the audit, uh, the audit job. So part of this requirement, a very important critical requirement prior to acceptance of an audit engagement is that the new audit firm is required to write to the retiring auditor should not be accepted. So as an audit firm coming in to a company that had auditors before, one of the first things you should do is to, after going through the screening part really, is to seek permission of the company to get information from the previous auditor or to write to the retiring officer auditor. If you remember our, our discussion about exception to confidentiality, one of the first points we mentioned is the fact that an auditor can disclose information if he has gotten the consent of the company to do so. And so that is why that requirement comes in here. You need to obtain the client's permission to get information from the previous auditor. And what information are you getting? Basically, you're looking at, is there any reason based on your experience with this person? why I should not accept this engagement. Now, if the company you want to audit says, yes, you proceed to contact the auditor, the previous auditor, but the retiring auditor really. But if they say no, what should you do? Now, if they said no, that already tells you that there's something they're hiding or there's something they don't want you to know. So the proper thing to do is to decline their offer to be appointed as an auditor. If they say yes, like we mentioned, you proceed to write to that retiring auditor. Now, when the auditor receives your letter, due to your confidentiality, an exception to the rule, the auditor is expected to write to the client, requesting their permission to discuss the client affairs with you. Now, when they write, if the client, the company declines 
the permission of the auditor to give you information, that auditor is expected to come back to you and say, we, have, we got your letter, we have written to the company to seek their own permission to give this information, but the company has declined that request. And as such, we are unable to provide this information or that is, how, that is what it is. And when that is done, what should the new auditor do? The new auditor should de may then decline the offer. Oftentimes for in practice, really, when the new auditor received that information from the previous auditor, they would write to the company just one more time and just to ask that you give us permission to speak to this auditor to ask for information. We've asked for this information and they said you've declined uh, the request for them to discuss with us. Can you provide clarity on this or was there a mix up or something? And if the firm, if the company insists or said, we don't want that discussion to take place, then the proper thing for the audit firm to do is to decline that, that nomination to act as auditor. So why do we have this ethical requirement for the new auditor to communicate with the previous auditor? Now there are two key reasons. One is to protect the shareholders. The shareholders are the owners of the business. So as an auditor, you should know if there are any reasons or anything that the owners need to know or that you need to take into consideration in providing a report to the owners. So that protects the, the shareholders. And secondly, it serves as a means of professional courtesy. So we know that there is that collaboration, that collaboration between members of, uh, of the profession. Now, after you accepted the engagement, there are a number of procedures that you need to undertake. The new auditor should ensure, as part of that, that the outgoing auditor's removal, retirement, or resignation is in line with the provisions of applicable company law. The auditor should also ensure that their own appointment is valid and formalized. And so you know that auditors will be appointed at an annual general meeting by members. And so the auditor should ensure that they get a copy of the resolution that was passed at that general meeting, just to validate the fact that they've been properly appointed by members or owners of the business at an annual general meeting. Now, where a portion or part of the outgoing, outgoing auditor's fees has not been paid, the new auditor should support them to ensure that that payment is released on a timely basis. Now, when as part of that, one key requirement to be done after the auditor has been appointed and before commencement of the audit is that the new auditor should then prepare and submit a letter of engagement to the directors of the client company for acceptance by sign off. So what is a letter of engagement? That would consider shortly. The new auditor is also required to make arrangement to collect all the books, documents, and papers that belongs to the client from the outgoing auditors. The outgoing auditors are expected to cooperate in that regard and transfer all such documents that are currently with them. So all the documents of the previous, of the client really, that are with the previous auditor should be sub submitted to the new auditor. So the new auditor should make arrangement to collect those, uh, those documents. However, there is an exception. There are some documents that the auditor cannot collect. And those will be records that were tied to outstanding fees. So if the if company is still owing the, out, the retiring auditor, and um, part of the agreement is the fact that some documents would serve as, uh, as a lien or collateral for, so to say, for that fee, then the retiring audit office or, or auditor is not under obligation to submit those documents to the new auditor. What the new auditor will basically do is to ensure that they support the retiring auditor in getting their fees paid on time so that those documents can subsequently be released. So we mentioned 
there that part of the post acceptance procedure is that the auditor should submit a letter of engagement to the company directors for their acceptance or sign off. So what is a letter of engagement? Letter of engagement is a letter that is sent by the auditors to a client immediately the auditor is appointed and before the commencement of the audit. Please take note of when the letter of engagement is sent. It is immediately the, appoint, the auditor is appointed and it would ordinarily be signed off before the commencement of the audit. Why should that letter be signed before you start the audit? It is because of the content of that letter. So that letter of engagement sets out the terms of the engagement and forms the basis of the contract. So if we're going to enter into a contract for something, it's important that we both have an understanding as to what our responsibilities are. So as a company, what are you meant to do? What are you meant to provide? As an auditor, what am I meant to do? What am I meant to have access to? So once we have that common understanding documented and signed off, it becomes easier and legally, it becomes easier to perform the audit and that becomes a legally binding um, document. So what is the main emphasis or the main consent of that letter of engagement? So the word there is we want to engage want to be engaged in a contract, want to be engaged in something, we need a letter to bind that engagement. So the main emphasis really of this letter is to spell out the relevant responsibilities of the directors and the auditors and the scope of the audit. Please take note of that. It spells out the responsibilities, the main emphasis of that letter, the main focus of that letter is to spell out, to highlight, to state the responsibilities of the directors. Directors, these are your responsibility. You are expected to prepare the account of the company, expected to ensure that this account is free and fair, you're responsible for the detection of fraud. Auditors, these are your responsibilities. Our responsibility is to review this account and to express our opinion as to the truth and fairness of the financial statement. Our responsibility might involve reviewing um, director's report or other statements in the annual report to ensure that we do not have any material inconsistency. Our rights would be, in the course of this engagement, would have a right to access all records that are required to conduct this audit. We have a right access and inquire from all officers, employees of the organization on matters that we think are relevant to our audit. Those are the content of a letter of engagement. It also speak to the, to the scope. So because it's an, it's, it's an audit of, so if you're doing an audit of financial statement, your scope will speak to, okay, audit will focus on um, all um, transaction vouchers and the financial statements, such as uh, financial statement, your statement of cash flow, your 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 uh, income statement, your balance sheet, you know all the financial records that you that you need to review or that you'll be required to review um, to form an opinion. So, what are the purpose of a letter of engagement? Just to re-emphasize that one, it's to define clearly the extent of the auditors and directors' responsibilities. By formalizing the terms of engagement, it helps to minimize the possibility of any misunderstanding between the auditors and the client. So there wouldn't be a case of, we are supposed to do this. No, I'm not meant to do that. Ah, you've done this and you stopped here. Why not do this as well? No, this is where, I, this is where this, our work is meant to end. We're only doing financial statement review. We're not, doing, we're not preparing the statement for you. We're not investigating fraud for you. So it prevents such misunderstanding because the letter would have clearly spelled out the responsibilities of the parties. The letter also serves to provide written confirmation of the auditor's acceptance of the appointment. That confirms 
legally that they've accepted an appointment. It also it confirms in writing verbal arrangement in respect of the audit, in respect mm -hmm. of the audit scope, the form of their report, and the scope of any non audit service. So if there are any non audit service as well, the letter of engagement would include that and the nature of um, that uh, review. So what are the content of the letter of engagement? I'm sure you should know that by now. Basically, you capture the board of directors' responsibilities in respect of the proper books of accounts and financial statements, the auditor's responsibilities to report on the financial statements, the scope and basis of the audit work to be under second, fees and billing arrangements, where appropriate, arrangement concerning the involvement of other auditors and expert in some aspect of the audit. So if you're going to do an audit that would basically involve testing some inventory to ensure that it's, it's the standard you require, um, the auditor might not have that expertise to do that. So if you know that you're going to have to involve experts to do certain checks for you, the audit work should, uh, should include, uh, would include that an arrangement in place for the auditor to provide other assurance services, such as taxation, financial advisory. So if the auditor needs to provide other services, like we mentioned, the responsibility of the auditors really. So that's, that's part of it. If it's included in that, in their responsibility, you should state it. Any restriction of the auditor's liabilities to the client. So for some audit in a letter, um, if the auditor is negligent, there's always the fact that the auditor would be sued for that negligence and he might have to pay fine or something just to ensure that um, the auditor is protected. Some engagement letter includes a clause that says, okay, this is the highest um, our obligation would be with regards to this audit. But then the law for limited liability companies, that's limited liability really, for limited liability companies, companies that corporate companies, very companies that are that are listed, that clause cannot be inserted into the letter of engagement. So another content of the letter of engagement is a proposed timetable for the for the engagement, and then a request for written acknowledgement of the letter. Thus, those are the content of a letter of engagement. So summarily, we're looking at the responsibilities of both parties, the responsibility of the auditor, the responsibility of the company's directors, the scope of the audit. But then this is broken down into sub um, things. Right? So for instance, we're looking at other advisory services, if there are, so which is a uh, form part of the responsibility of the auditor. Now, after the engagement letter has been issued and signed off, it might be possible, it's possible for that engagement letter to be revised. The letter should be issued to any new client before work begins and reviewed every year to ensure that it is up to date. That's very important and it's key. Don't forget that the auditor is appointed for one year tenure, for years tenure from this year's annual general meeting to the next. So that means that if he's reappointed, it's only proper to look at that engagement letter again, review it to ensure that it is up to date. Another, 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 another instance that can lead to a revision of that engagement letter is whenever there is a change of circumstance, possibly there's a need to have the auditor perform more work that was not captured before, or the new guidelines that the auditor needs to comply with or that form the material part of the review, or there's a change in the nature of the service provided or, or, or other terms of that engagement, it's only proper for a new letter of engagement to be issued to an existing client. The letter is to be addressed to the board of directors or audit committee of the client company. Please take note of that. The letter of engagement is to be addressed to the board of directors or other committee of the 
or audit committee of the client company. Why is this the case? That is because if you remember who appoints an auditor, you recall that auditors are appointed by shareholders or by directors. So it's only proper that that letter is addressed to those who are responsible for the appointment. So in the case of shareholders, members of the audit committee would often represent the shareholders. Because members of the audit committee uh, would be, be composed of sh members, shareholders, members of uh, the independent shareholders or representatives by shareholders, as well as their uh, management and directors as, as, as well. So it's really proper that letter be addressed uh, to them. So what are some factors that might necessitate the need for a new or revised engagement letter? One, an indication that the client must understand the objective and scope of the audit. So once there's that, that hint or if there's that feeling that some of the terms used in that letter, it's not clear and it's subject to interpretation, it's important to clarify that by issuing a new letter of engagement. If there's a change of management, board of directors or audit committee, if there's a change, significant change in ownership of the company. So there are new owners. It's important for the new owners to know who you are as auditor and to accept your terms as contained in the letter of engagement, or the agreed terms, sorry, as contained in the letter of engagement. Any change in the size and nature of the client business, significant change really, and any relevant change in law or professional requirements. Let's discuss engagement letter for public sector audit. So by public sector, we mean um, audit of government, power status, ministries, and establishment. So what's the requirement of the law regarding um, the issue of engagement letter. For pri audit of private company, the issue of engagement letter is mandatory and is a key requirement. But for issue of, for, for audit of public sector entity, it's important to state that an engagement letter, the purpose is the same, whether it is issued for private sector audit or for public sector audit, which is basically to spell out the responsibilities of the parties in that engagement and the scope of the work. However, for public sector or government establishment, there are regulations, laws that govern their operations. And all public sector, in public sector, it's generally expected that they appoint a public sector auditor. And in this sector, on in, in this sector, the use of engagement letter is really not a widespread practice because it is not mandatory. It's not mandatory right? because the, the 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 expectation from auditors is, is captured in certain laws that guide the operation of public sector. So the expectation, the roles, the responsibility of the party is already spelled out in, 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 in regulation, in, in certain uh, regulation in, in different in countries. So why issue a letter of engagement? So that's why they don't make it mandatory. However, it is highly recommended that this letter be put in place. In the public sector, specific requirement exists within the legislation governing the audit mandate. For example, the auditor may be required to report directly to a minister, the legislature, or the public if management, including the department head, attempts to limit the scope of the audit. So it's essentially what we just said, really. There are laws, there are regulations guiding public sector audits, guiding the, the responsibilities of the parties to sort an audit. So that because of that, it's not mandatory. However, it is highly recommended. And that's why it's not a widespread practice really, because it's by public sector auditors. But for private sector, it is a mandatory requirement. We want to consider auditor's responsibility to consider frauds and 
error fraud error those are two key terms you need to understand for your exams for auditors it's important to state that throughout the audit process from when you're planning the audit when you're doing your your check your client screening but after you've done your client screening you've started your, the audit and you start planning really so when you're planning to conduct that actual audit to when you are performing the audit itself to when you're looking at the report trying to put together the report communicate the report and the stuff the auditor should consider throughout that audit process the risk of material misstatement in the financial statement due to fraud or error that's because as auditors you are there to express an opinion as to the true and fairness of the financial statement and if there is fraud fraudulent financial reporting it impacts on the trueness of that financial statement so even though you consider that risk in your review it is important to state that it is not the auditor's responsibility to prevent fraud and error let me take it again even though in the conduct of the audit the auditor should consider the impact of fraud the risk of material misstatement in the financial statement due to audit it is not the auditor's responsibility to prevent fraud and error that responsibility is that of management that's because the auditor generally does not consider he doesn't review everything in the financial statement he only reviews material item and it's also important to state too for your exam that this consideration of the risk of material misstatement due to fraud is considered throughout the audit process so you could have a question that said when does the cost that when does the auditor consider the risk of of uh, uh, or risk of financial uh, risk of material misstatement in the financial statement due to fraud so you could have during the planning stage during the con uh, performance of the audit itself during the evaluation and reporting of the audit work and then throughout the audit process so the answer would be throughout the audit process uh, the auditor would consider that the risk of material misstatements due to fraud so let's look at these terms now in in in, in detail so fraud what is fraud? Fraud is an intentionally deceptive action designed to provide the perpetrator with an unlawful gain or to deny a right to a victim. So there are two elements that makes an action to be fraud. One, it's intentional. So it's an intentional deceptive action the perpetrator knows that i want to do this thing this is what i want to do i want to commit this fraudulent action he knows what he knows that this is what is planned and that action is such a way that it provides the person that is initiating the fraud with an unlawful gain or denies the right to a victim those are two elements of a fraud and fraud can be carried out either by one person or by a group of people um, either employees of the business as individuals or colliding uh, management of the business or even external parties so for instance you have um, vendors who have been employed uh, third party vendors who supply goods to the to the organization they could collide with the employee to issue fraudulent invoices for the purpose of defrauding the company or they could inflate the bill and then they share the proceed from that uh, from that fraudulent act and you can notice that in these two examples i mentioned there is that intention is that is that uh that the decision made on the part of the parties involved to carry it out out and it's done for their own gain or to cause harm to the victim 
So what are some examples of fraudulent activities? So we could have um, example would be manipulation, falsification, or alteration of records or documents. So you'd you'd have um, you have a receipt that you that only was bought for a million, but then you strike that out and you write two million. That's what that is falsification or manipulation of records. Or possibly you just get a receipt for something that never happened. Um, a second example of fraudulent activity is misappropriation of assets or theft. So you'd have this, um, so misappropriate means to use it for the purpose it's not meant for. That's the meaning of misappropriation of assets. So that's another, um, another um, example of fraudulent activity. So let's add it at its simplest form. So as an employee, you have a company's vehicle, but then you'd use it for your own personal activity. So you are misappropriating that asset or oh, theft, outright theft, stealing, really. A third example of fraudulent activity is suppression or omission of the effects of transaction from records or documents. So you would you you would want to omit certain transactions from the account. So a business, for instance, that is looking at uh, declaring profits, which profit to, to, to impress the owners might remove some expense, do not report some expense so that the profit would, uh, would increase. A fourth one would be recording of transactions without um, substance. And fourth, intentional misapplication of accounting principles. So there's accounting rules around when um, revenue, for instance, is to be recognized. So for instance, in the IFRS standard of revenue states that you don't really re rec uh, recognize revenue when you've passed control of what you are selling to the other party. So, so for instance, you say you're selling, um, you're selling a house, you build, you build and sell houses, and then you, you ordinarily, it's when you sell that you get revenue. But rather than, it's when you say, sorry, you pass the property to the other person, your house is completed. But rather than wait for that process to be finished, you decide to record the, the sale price of the revenue as you are building the house. That will be an, a misapplication of accounting policy. And that is a um, fraud. Fraud because one, it is intentional. You know what you're doing. Two, because it results in a, while you a, while you are the person, if it's a business, might not uh, gain from that mis, mis uh, what do you call it recording, but it did, it can also be to the shareholders. You're giving them wrong wrong report, and so it's harmful to them. It denies them the right to get a um, correct uh, financial statement. So as opposed to fraud, error this time refers to unintentional mistakes in financial statements. So the key word there is unintentional. So an error, that error is mistake. I made a mistake. I was meant to impute 30. I imputed 33. So it was a mistake. You, it, wasn't, it wasn't intentional. And you didn't do it for the purpose of gaining any, any to getting any financial gain out of it. Just pure, pure, pure mistake. So what are examples of errors? We would have uh, mathematical or clerical mistakes in the underlying records and accounting data, omission or misinterpretation of accounting policies. So it wasn't intentional. You didn't know that's what it's meant to be. And but then <laughs> it is what it is. It was an error. <clears throat> and uh, that's an also unintentional application of accounting policies. So in this case of revenue, possibly they did it because they didn't know that's what it's meant to do. But if you intentionally under, do that, it becomes, a, it becomes a fraud. So what are some of the things the auditors could look at to point to the fact that they could be fraud in that organization? Because like we said, the auditors should consider, they are not responsible for preventing fraud, but they should consider the fact that if there is fraud, that will impact on the, the true and fairness of that financial statement. So what are some of the things they could look out for? One is weakness in the design of the accounting and internal control systems and non-compliance with identified internal controls. So 
that's important. So if, for instance, um, one person in the organization is responsible for issuing check, if we want to buy something, I have a checkbook, I write the check, I take it to the bank, I will do the money, I go to, I go to the market, I buy the, the item myself, that is the weak control. Because that means that you could write any amount, it gives you opportunity to falsify records for what you buy, because you are responsible for all the activities. So once an auditor sees that kind of process, that there are no, there are no um, appropriate division or segregation of duties, that points to the risk, the auditors to the risk that fraud might be happening. The second question is with respect to the integrity or competence of management. So once you start seeing questions, publication about management, integrity, management action, that points you to the possibility that the fraud could be happening. A short red flag we should note, note with regards to the possibility of fraud, it's when there is unusual pressure within an entity. So if as a CEO, the owners of the business have told you that at the end of this year, we need our profit to be minimum of $10 billion. That puts pressure on the CEO. So the CEO would want to do anything to meet that target, including committing fraud or manipulating the financial records, inflating, inflating revenue. So if sales was uh, uh, 1 billion, you want, they might want to inflate the sales figure to 2 billion and put that, that, uh, th th that difference as, uh, as debt that uh, we sold it to, but they've not paid and they recognize uh, revenue. But what they basically done is fraudulent financial statements. So pressure, undue pressure on members of the organization points us on the, on the, on employees of the organization rather points to the existence of fraud. Another red flag you want to look out for, it's unusual transactions. So transactions that are not typical of that, uh, of the organization. So if the organization has before now been doing all these transactions within the country, all its expense within the country, and then suddenly you are seeing transfers to places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, then that should point you to the fact that something could be wrong. And then if you have a problem in obtaining audit evidence, you, you, want, you want data, you take, I want this file. It takes like uh, weeks for you to get it. And even when they bring it, it's not complete. You have to ask for record again, you know. That tells you, professional skepticism tells you that something could be, could be wrong um, somewhere. So, but as I like that, these are called red flags or indicators that fraud might be happening. They don't, they don't, they are not telling you that fraud has occurred. They are not a, a, a ticker for saying, the yeah, ones I see on your transaction, there is fraud. Once I see that is pressure for employees to meet target, that is fraud. No, these are just indicators, possibility that fraud would occur. So that helps you and as an auditor to know the areas to focus your audit review more on. So what are the auditors, what are the auditor's responsibilities for fraud detection? So we say for fraud prevention, the auditor does not, is not responsible in any way in the prevention of fraud, even though the fact that they conduct an audit can sometimes detect people from committing a fraud. That is very true. So if people know that they, you're going to go to audit, they, they might not commit a fraud because they are afraid that they might get caught. So it deter them from committing fraud. But that you, it is not your responsibility to prevent fraud. But in terms of detection, based on the risk assessment, the auditor should design audit procedures so as to have a reasonable expectation of detecting statements arising from fraud or error, which are material to the financial statement. So once you've identified some of these things you mentioned on the red flags, you should, in designing the things you would check called your audit procedures, it should be such, in such a way that it helps you to detect if there's any material misstatement due to fraud or error. So say for instance, you find that uh, employees, there's this unusual pressure for employees to meet target. So that tells you that there's a risk that people might want to increase their revenue lines. So what should you do as auditor? You should, when you're doing your, your audit sampling, you should look more on revenue line, focus more on doing careful check 
on material revenue item. So that's what it helps you to do really. So between fraud and error, which one is easier to find? It's clear it is error because error is a mistake. The auditor, the, so the, the employee involved undertakes uh, does it without knowing, even knowing that uh, that's what they are meant, uh, that, that's what they are doing, funny enough. But in fraud, it is an intentional action. So those that perpetrate the fraud, we want to take whatever action is required to hide that, that fraud, such as collusion between them, between the different employees, or even falsifying record or to tally with uh, the fraudulent uh, action. So what happens if the auditor, if a fraud is detected after an audit work? Does it mean that the auditor did not perform his work correctly or the, the, office, the auditor was negligent? No. The discovery of material misstatement on the financial statement after the auditor's report does not in itself indicate that the auditors have failed to adhere to the basic principles and essential procedures of an audit. Let's illustrate this. So, Auditors do two things. One, they conduct sample. Two, fraud. Those that commit fraud take careful care to hide their fraudulent act, including collusion. So let's take an example now. So as an auditor, let's assume that you, you made this, the, the, the employee, the company is under pressure, money is under pressure to deliver. And so the record in the book that is sold an item for five billion when in reality it was sold for one billion they have the records they sign the contract yeah and then they, co they collude with the person that they are selling the item to and say don't worry this item was selling it for you for it's meant to be one billion but if you agree to sign that we, we sold it to you for five billion we'll give you some discount behind the scene or something or something and we'll write we'll write it off now the auditor comes in he checks, he says that uh, this revenue is reported as 5 billion. Looks at the sales contract, 5 billion is there. And uh, the person that bought it signed 5 billion. The company has confirmed, signed that they sold it for 5 billion. Possibly they took an extra step to write a letter to the person that bought it and say, please confirm, did you buy this thing for 5 billion? That one, because they've colluded there, the management, the company that took it to him, they've agreed and he knows he's, 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 he's going to get something out of it. He confirmed and say yes, I actually sold this thing. I said I actually bought this item for five billion. Now, if subsequently it is discovered that it wasn't five billion, it was just one billion, because he definitely the person will not pay five billion. <clears throat> the auditor cannot be said to be responsible because he had taken all the necessary procedures that should be undertaken regards to that um, that review so you may find that a fraud is discovered doesn't mean that the auditor was negligent as long as they've undertaken reasonable care like we discussed under um skills care and competence reasonable care in the conduct and review of um of the financial statements so we've looked at the auditor responsibility what are the director's responsibilities the director the responsibility of the directors for the prevention of fraud and error. The directors are actually responsible for this. That responsibility for the prevention of fraud and errors rests with directors, and they do this through the implementation and continued operation of adequate accounting and internal control system. So they put in place processes, procedures, act to review monitoring to ensure that. Um, fraud is detected and um, prevented. But the truth is, regardless of the kind of activity processes you put in place, that doesn't guarantee that fraud may never happen. That is because there's a risk of collusion. There's a risk that people will make error in carrying out their work. Error in, in judgment in carrying out their work. So because of this, you can't give any guarantee that your system of control will completely eliminate fraud. So when, a, when an auditor um, suspects that fraud or error may exist, what should the auditor do? One, the auditor should consider the impact on the figures reported in the financial statement. 
Why? Because the auditors are only concerned about, primarily concerned about materiality, things that have a material impact on the financial statement. And what is materiality? Materiality basically means, a material amount basically means that if that figure is not correct, then it will impact on the decision of those that rely on that financial statement to make decision. So if they discover that it's material, then they should perform necessary additional procedures and even modify what they had planned to do before, just to ensure that they can validate the impact of that fraud. The extent of such modified or additional procedures depends on the auditor's judgment as to A, the type of fraud or error, the likelihood of their occurrence, and then the likelihood that a particular type of fraud or error would have a material effect on the financial statement. Now, if you suspect that fraud exists as an auditor, you cannot assume that it is that is just it's just that incidence of fraud that you have in that financial statement that is an isolated occurrence. You cannot make that assumption except you've conducted due review. So that's why it's important to conduct additional review to be sure that 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 is not just that one you discovered is not uh, it's not uh, the only one that they, it's possible that there are other incidents of fraud really of that uh, similar similar nature in the financial statement. And then. What should you do next? You should discuss the discovery with management, the directors or audit committee, and consider whether the matter has been properly reflected or corrected in the financial statement. So if, for instance, you, you in the course of your review, discover that uh, the company was meant to report expense of 8 million, but in the course of the, re in the, course of the review, they reported in sorry in the financial statement they reported five million and you discover that ah the difference is due to fraud, fraudulent financial reporting. They deliberately underreported by five million to five million, so that the profit will increase by three million. Now in that situation, and you discovered it, the, the directors of the company need to adjust the financial statement by. Uh, uh, providing for that extra expense that was not included. So it's important to ensure that that is reflected in the financial statement. If the performance of the modified or additional procedures support their suspicion of fraud or error, the auditors need to consider the legal consequences. This involves considering whether it is appropriate to contact the entity's lawyers or whether to seek their own legal advice and what future action they need to take. So the auditors on their own accord, we need to look at, okay, we've discovered fraud, we've checked and we can confirm that fraud actually um, happened. So the auditors, we need to look at the law. What does the law say about when a fraudulent action is discovered? Does it require that the auditors should report to the government agencies about this fraud? Does it require that uh, the auditors take a particular action? Now, but to protect themselves against legal actions, it is important for the auditors to seek legal advice. So let's look at reporting procedures, really. Reporting procedures. So it starts this way. The auditor suspects that there's a fraud. The auditor decides to conduct additional procedures, additional review to confirm if that fraud actually happens and if it is material to the financial statement. Now, after conducting that review, the auditor discovers that this amount is material. It impacts on the financial statement and that the fraud actually occurs. So who should the auditor report to? Now, the first person the auditor should report to is to management. So that's why I have that heading says reporting fraud and error to management. So they need to report to management on the fraud. However, if the fraud was committed by management, it doesn't make any sense reporting to the management themselves because they will take steps to hide it or to, to, to hide it or get the auditor out, uh, out of the audit. 
So if the, the CEO is the one involved in the fraud or top management, the proper thing to do really is to report to the next higher authority. Let me take that again. The auditor discovers fraud. Whom should the auditor report to? The auditor should communicate factual findings to management, the board of directors, and the audit committee as soon as practicable. The first person the auditor should report to should be management. Give them the fact, the findings, and the discovery. When should they do this? If they suspect that fraud may exist, or even if the potential effect on the material statement is immaterial, that is for management, so that they can correct um, the, the control system. And then if material error is actually found to exist. Now, if it's not material, if it's immaterial, as auditors, you want to help the organization improve their control system. So you, you report it to management and you do, might not really not be any need to involve um, the board of directors and the audit committee because it's not uh, it's not material it doesn't materially impact the financial statement but the fact that you've known it you could you let them know so they can correct it however if it is material and the parties involved your management staff then the rules is that you report to the next authority on the hierarchy that is not involved in the fraud so that case that would be to report it to members of the company. That would be to report it to the members of the company. So auditors should consider the implications for their report if they, sus if they conclude that a suspected instance of fraud or error has a material effect on the financial statements and they disagree with the accounting treatment or with the extent or the lack of any disclosure in the financial statements of the instance or its consequence, or if they are unable to determine whether fraud or error has occurred. So basically, the auditors, like we mentioned, it's not their responsibility to do a detailed investigation on fraud. So if you've done your review, your preliminary review, and you feel and you highly suspect that fraud has occurred, possibly you can see that there's no substance around this transaction. You should report it. Report it to, to the management first. If it's material, if it's not material, the fact that you've seen it, because if you didn't set out to find fraud, but in the course of your review, you found that there's possibly fraud, it's possibly material error. Report it to management. If management is involved, report it. Don't report it to them. Report it to members of the company. Now, if the a fraud or error is not material from your review, no material, then a report to the management would be sufficient. Because your opinion in the, as to, to, on the financial statement is on items that have a material impact on the financial report. So if an item doesn't have a material impact on the financial report, you can't say that the financial statement is not true and fair when the right item is actually not uh, material. So, the auditors should not refrain from qualifying their opinion on the ground that the position has been corrected since the balance sheet date or because of the possible consequence of qualification. So for instance, if you discovered um, a fraud for a previous year, this year, that previous year's report has already been issued. So it's important that that report be made so that people know that the report that was issued prior to now had um, fraudulent financial it was final, final figures in, in, in it. And also, it's also important to know that auditors should not consider the consequence of issuing a modified or a qualified opinion. So what that means is for when you go to all these companies will tell you if you qualify our financial report, uh, people will no longer do business with us and that will impact on our profit going forward. Such should not impact on the auditor's opinion. Work. Your work is to express opinion, your views as to the true and fairness of the financial statement. So do your work and say it uh, as it is. A third group of people that the auditors could actually report to uh, is to third 
parties. There might be cases when the hospital might need to report to third parties, to external parties, but there are conditions for that. One is if they are, if they are under statutory duty to do so. So if the law requires that they report to some other external bodies, for example, the company, company, the company uh, registry, reg company affairs commission or something, if the law states that, then they have to make that re report. The second condition under which an entity can report to external party is where the entity is unable to provide evidence that the matter has been reported. So if the entity is required to report, the company itself is required to report, and they have not done that report. As an auditor, they are required to make such a report. In extreme cases, really, the auditors should report a matter directly to a proper authority in the public interest and without discussing the matter with the entity if they conclude that the suspected instance of fraud or in particular cases error should be so reported and it has caused loss, loss of confidence in the integrity of the directors. So those are three conditions, situations where the auditors can report fraudulent actions to third parties. So auditors report to take note of auditors report to management. Management is the first point of call when auditors suspect fraud. Next point of call is members of the company, the shareholders, the directors, the the non-executive directors and members of the company. The third point of call would often be to external parties. External parties would be possibly government agencies, not just anybody on the street really, but possibly government agencies or, 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 or so. But that is based on the three conditions provided. It's required by law for the auditors to do so. It's required by law for the company to, to do so themselves but they have not done it. Three, the auditor has cause to believe that making that report is in the public interest because there's a lot of confidence in the director. But it's important to state that for issues like this, it's that the auditor seeks legal advice before proceeding with that report so that they are, they are protected in case of uh, litigation by the client. So um, we've spoken about confidentiality, disclosure requirement, and code of conduct of confidentiality, an exception to the confidentiality rule. So it's important to state that when that confidential, confidentiality rule is breached, the company, the, the audit firm is protected in some cases. In the case of breach of confidentiality, if it's made in public interest, is made to an appropriate body or person. Public interest, appropriate body um, or person that is meant to receive that report. That's why it's important to seek legal advice. The auditors should seek legal advice. And there is no malice motivating the, dis the disclosure. So it doesn't as if the audit, audit firm is trying to get back at the company for, for some uh, disagreement before, before then. In the case of defamation, it's important that the disclosure is made in their capacities as auditors of the entity concerned, and that there is also no malice motivating the disclosure. When can an auditor withdraw from an audit engagement? One, the auditor might withdraw from an audit engagement in certain situations. For example, if they consider that you've employed us as an auditor, but you've not given us the information we require to conduct our work. So why are we uh, why are we auditors? And secondly, if they see no opportunity for reporting such information to the shareholders, why they act as uh, auditors. So when should an auditor consider withdrawing from an engagement 
one if they feel that the firm the company has not given them the record the documents they request to do their work if you've not given you the record to do your work on what basis are you conducting an audit so the auditor may consider withdrawing secondly if as an audit firm you feel that you have certain things you need to bring to the attention of the owner don't forget that the owners of the business have appointed the management to take care of their business so as auditors you only get access to the owners if you are invited in a meeting that possibly is put together and invited through the management team or something so if you are struggling to get access to the owner of the business and you feel that the only way you could get access to them is if you send in your resignation letter because in that resignation letter you have to state include your statement of circumstance and so in that statement of circumstance it gives an opportunity to say this is the reason why we're resigning this is we need to get into in touch with the owners to discuss certain matters and that letter will go to the registry of companies who will ensure that that is um, done so if you feel that you need to speak to the owners and you're not getting traction in doing that withdrawing from the engagement gives you the opportunity to put that in writing and the law will support you in getting access to to the owner however this should be your last resort so you should have tried all other options all other alternative to get things done and when it doesn't work then before you now proceed uh, with this. So that what means is if, for instance, on your first call, you're struggling to get documents, why not speak to other management team, other members of the company, other directors of the company that you know or have access to, and to see if you can get uh, the document, the required document. It is only when you've tried all these available options and you still don't get traction that you can then decide to resign. So withdraw from an engagement should be the last resort by an audit um, audit firm. So uh, we'll speak to auditors' re responsibility to consider non-compliance with laws and regulation. It's actually similar. The provisions here are actually similar to the, the provisions on fraud, error, and, uh, and, and fraud. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at this next. But before we proceed, please, let's quickly review key questions from this session. Um, we'll look at some of the key set questions. So um, if you have a pen and paper, you could attempt these questions and then we'll display the answer at the end. So the first question is, which of the following letters confirms the acceptance and understanding of the audit assignments? So you have a comfort letter, letter of consent, engagement letter, management letter, letter of the presentation. Second question, which of the following should be included in an audit engagement letter? So this speaks to the consent of an audit engagement letter. The third one, third question, multiple choice. Apart from the statutory qualifications, which of the following qualities and traits should an auditor not possess? So that should be the part we discussed about the integrity, objectivity, and the likes. So which of these threats should an auditor not possess? Uh, fourth one, an auditor may disclose clients' confidential information in the following, for the following reasons, except. So we discuss this, conditions under which client might disclose confidential information. Fifth one, statements which show the basic procedure contained in the standard is to be applied sorry statement we show how the basic procedures contained in the standard is to be applied is described as what short answer questions when should an engagement letter be sent to a prospective client so think of it when is it when should that happen before the engagement for accepting the engagement or when so think it we've discussed that who may appoint the first auditors of a company to ensure number question eight to ensure that the objectivity of the auditor is not threatened, the remuneration paid by one client or group of connected clients should not exceed dash of practice income for listed and other public interest companies. 
So that percentage should be for listed and other public companies. So in the course of our, our, our session, we spoke of 15%, 10%. So which of them is for public listed and other public interest companies? So that's the part you need to, that's what the person is asking for. Number nine, a new letter of engagement is necessitated by a change in the official address of the auditor. True or false? There's a change in auditor's address that it states that a new engagement letter is issued. Finally, the term which connotes an unintentional mistake in financial statement is known as unintentional mistake. What is that known as? Okay, so the answers. So one C D D B C, and then the short answer for letter of uh, engagement is issued immediately. The auditor is appointed, and before the commencement of the audit, the, the first auditor is generally appointed by the directors. And then on audit fee for listed and public entities, it is ten percent, but for non-listed entity, it is what. 15 percent and then we have um change of address not a reason for changing uh, updating the letter of engagement rather we're looking at things related to a change in the structure of uh, the company change in management or if the company does not understand the terms of that the first letter you issued so you start it's subject to interpretation so you feel that we need to clarify some of the things in here so you would issue a revised um, letter of engagement. On the third question, unintentional mistake is an error. It is intentional acts, intentional acts for the benefit of the perpetrator that causes harm to the company that is termed uh, fraud. So just a key point from this session, really. Um, what are the key points you want to take you from here? Every company by law is required to have its financial statement audited before circulation to members and other stakeholders. It is a statutory requirement. For someone to be appointed as auditor, key second takeaway, they should be a qualified accountant who has been duly licensed to practice who appoints the auditor? Auditors are generally appointed by members. However, for the first auditor or where casual vacancy exists, the directors of the company may appoint an auditor. Who fixes the remuneration of auditors? It is determined by who appoints the auditor. So if the auditor is appointed by members of the company, they fix the remuneration. If they're appointed by directors, they fix the remuneration. And the, off, the, the auditors will hold office for one year from the beginning of that audit year to the end. And then at the next annual general meeting, they will be up for possible re-election. An auditor, just like in every employment, can resign before he completes his term of office based on some conditions which we discussed. On the other hand, too, the company, the owners of the business have a right to remove the auditor from office, but that might must be in line with the provisions of the law. The auditor, by virtue of his appointment, has some responsibilities and rights which cannot be compromised in any way. So the rights, we're looking at right to access the books of account, right to access employees of the company and ask the relevant questions that are required to conduct your audit. The responsibility, you need to provide, um, provide um, your opinion, express your opinion as the truth and fairness of the financial statement. You need to comment on other additional information that is included in financial statements, which of the director's um, report as well as to whether it's true or fair. If you have other other, other special investigation or work you require to do, you need to comment on the on that as well. The auditor, by virtue of his appointment and in course of executing his assignment, 
should demonstrate professional skills and competencies, as well as upholding requisite professional ethical behavior, such as objectivity, due care, fairness, and the like, and the, and, and the like, the likes. Do not responsible for the prevention of fraud and errors. The auditor in course of work may be held liable under contract under the law of thought and on an order under criminal law. So if, even though the auditor is not responsible for the prevention and detection of fraud and error, if in the conduct of their work, it's expected that they are meant to detect material misstatement in the financial statements, and they did not detect that, then they can be liable under law of thought and criminal law. We also know that the auditor has some responsibility towards the client's compliance with laws and error. So um, that will be the end of today's um, session. Um, for our next session, we'll begin by looking at the client's compliance with laws and order. The requirement on laws and order, laws and regulations, really, it's similar to the requirement on fraud and error. So we'll look at what the auditor's responsibility is as it regards uh, non-compliance with laws and regulation. And then we'll move on to section B of the syllabus. Thank you for today's session.